Hello, I'm Vince Staley, Executive Director of Media Impact Funders, and I would like to welcome you to the final installment of our 2020 Media Impact Forum. If you've been listening closely to our programs up until now, you might notice uh, some beautiful music that we start with. Um, that was Arnetta Johnson, who's a brilliant young trumpeter. She was with us last year in person at our Media Impact Forum, and we thought we'd like to bring her along with us uh, at least in spirit, uh, for the musical interludes that we've had. Throughout our forum over the past three weeks, we've explored the many ways that philanthropy can support media that investigates the issues of climate change and the broader environmental challenges. We've heard powerful and passionate encouragement for us to, to fund more media from an impressive array of voices, including legendary actress and activist Jane Fonda, and marine biologist Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, to name just a couple. We've heard from Al Roker about the value of investments and resources like the Climate Matters program that supports broadcast meteorologists and other journalists, and the impact that fact-based reporting has had in building widespread recognition that climate change is real. We've discussed the importance of hearing from indigenous people and other frontline reporters and the obligation to support efforts that will help keep them safe and healthy in the face of myriad dangers. We have also presented our own brand new report, Environmental Media Grant Making, How Funders Are Tipping the Scales Toward Change. And uh, in, in that we see a substantial amount of foundation support for media about the environment. And yet we believe that much, um, well, given the, the nature of the threats and the risks that we face, we need to do much, much more. And to underscore this point, today I have an article published in the Chronicle of Philanthropy in which I argue that philanthropy is correctly focused on addressing the great risks we face in society, issues like the spread of an infectious, infectious disease pandemic, um, as well as the growing danger of climate change. But the portion we spend sounding the alarm on these issues is a tiny fraction of what companies would spend for a similar objective. In our report, we identify about $167 million in grants for environmental media over the, just over the decade of 2009 to 2019. By contrast, in just one year, the top 10 property and casualty insurance companies like Geico and Farmers, they spent $6.7 billion to encourage consumers to address, to address the risks they face in life. At the heart of these discussions, a fundamental concern is the ability to ground our environmental media in solid science, to use evidence-based information effectively to help inform popular debate with credible stories, and that through journalism or documentary film or public awareness campaigns, that will lead to sensible decision-making. In today's discussion, we're going to lead off with Elizabeth Christofferson, president of the Rita Allen Foundation and a member of the MIF Board of Directors. At the Rita Allen Foundation, they have been leading a new movement on civic science, which hopes to spark a broad engagement with science and evidence that will help with, sorry, up to spark a broad engagement with science and evidence that will help to inform society's most pressing problems. Before I turn to the Zoom over to Elizabeth, I also note that we're coming to the end of our forum programming this year. So I want to just take a, a brief moment to introduce you all to our, um, to our staff who make these programs and everything we do at MIF possible. First, uh, Marie Porter is our operations manager. And um, Marie has been with us a little more than a year. Uh, she came on as our office manager, but that was back when we all actually went to an office. And in, in, in the time that she's been with us, she's taken over a, a myriad responsibilities throughout the organization, and thus her title reflects that. 
Sabira de Piero used to be our operations manager back before beautiful little Serafia came along. Sabira is now executive producer, which is an unusual role for a nonprofit philanthropy organization, but we are focused on media and Sabira helps us to pull it all together, working with program communications, pretty much all of the organization to help it run like a well-oiled machine, the way executive producers are supposed to do. Courtney Eshelman is our Director of Development and Member Engagement, and her most important role is to help build our network. And through that, we gratefully receive support from all of you uh, through grants and membership payments. So thanks very much for your support. Uh, and if you're not a member but would like to become one, please reach out to Courtney at Media Impact, uh, sorry, Courtney at mediafunders.org. If you were with us last week for our episode four in our series, you met Nina Sachdev, our Director of Communications, who oversees all of our publications and communications, newsletters, our website, social media accounts, our very active Twitter feed. Um, in fact, we'll be tweeting today as, as usual. Um, and, and especially overseeing the publication of our reports, like our new report on environmental media grant making. Thanks, Nina, for all of that work. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, Roshni Melia, who oversees all things program at Media Impact Funders. If you have ever been a speaker in one of our programs, you know what a meticulous and thoughtful professional she is. Um, we have been really happy with how well our remote form has gone, and I think much of that is due to Roshni's careful planning. In a previous year, our forum fell on June 28th, and I tortured Roshni by wishing her a happy birthday in front of a large crowd while she was moving chairs on stage. I won't do that today, uh, but on Saturday, we can all hum happy birthday to her wherever we are. She will be enjoying some well-deserved rest after the gargantuan task of organizing all of these programs. Thanks, Roshni. And now I'll turn the program over to Elizabeth. Typically, we note that we have 90 minutes in total with the first hour devoted to our moderated discussions and the remaining 30 minutes reserved for questions and comments. But with a little extra time for the staff acknowledgements we've just done, uh, we may go over time a little bit and we'll get into questions a little bit after 2 p.m. But I'm sure that we'll have plenty of time for questions. And so please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point in the next hour or so if you have a comment or a question. And we'll call on you when we get to that point in our discussion. Thanks, and please take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, Vince, and uh, thank you for a, a setup that uh, only begins to capture, I think, all of the uh, segments of the Sears Media Impact Forum, which I know was different than other years because uh, of, uh, of the situation that we're all in. And I know that you mentioned that it's been an impressive roster of speakers and engagement and discussions and leaving us with much to think about but I'm very glad that you also showed the impressive roster of team media impact funders who truly have worked very hard to, to help create this with your leadership and that of the uh, media impact funders board members who also uh, been are participating also. Uh, and I do uh, certainly encourage people to join uh, this growing community. Uh, it really uh, is important, uh, I think, to come together and to be discussing these uh, topics and really media's role in advancing uh, some of the important changes we want to see. I think a question that sort of resonates with me too is how do we each and as a community learn, change, and act to build a more equitable and resilient future? And this is a question that we've given a great deal of thought at Rita Allen uh, Foundation uh, where I sit because we're supporters both of basic scientific research and informed inclusive civic engagement and we have seen the urgency of crossing silos to address wicked, complex issues that face us and media's key role again in engaging diverse communities to help us make better choices. So at this forum, as Vince has noted, amidst a global pandemic, we can't lose sight of a global emergency that will be with us long after a vaccine is found and that is climate change. And some of the answers will come from science in the laboratory to conduct research on vaccines and climate models, and by scientists engaging in civic life in order to bring data and evidence to decision making. But solutions won't come from scientists alone or science alone. And we're grappling with long burning crises that make both climate change and COVID-19 pandemic so much worse as we've been discussing throughout the forum. Systemic racism, pervasive inequality, the exclusion of the most important voices in any solutions to climate change or public health, 
the voices of communities who are being most affected. And I'm glad that you also referenced Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who said at the start of this forum, the problem is really one of humanity. It's a lack of leadership, a lack of all the best ideas on the table. So our collaborative efforts with uh, uh, other funders and partners and uh, fellows require new approaches, new voices, and leveraging the full range of our resources. We know that not only because of our values, but also because of the evidence, the growing science of science communication has disproven the idea that just giving people more facts will change anything. Our communication has to be rooted in understanding diverse needs and identities and co-creating solutions together. And I'm really delighted to uh, uh, welcome two co-creators here with that in mind, Dr. Karen Andrade and Kishore Hari, uh, to talk more about bringing together science, media, diverse voices and decision making, and intersection we call civic science. So Karen is part of the first cohort of civic science fellows now beginning their work. She is a civic science fellow at the Science Philanthropy Alliance, which is a partnership among major private supporters of basic scientific research. And she is also an interdisciplinary environmental health scientist by training. She has expertise in community-based participatory research and a track record of engaging diverse communities in science. She'll share more with us about her experiences facilitating research collaborations between UC Berkeley students and San Francisco Bay Area communities. She's, she is a graduate of UC Davis and earned a PhD in environmental science from UC Berkeley. And she's still very young. Lots you've been doing, Karen. So Kishore Hari manages strategic partnerships, communications, and engagement at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. He is a longtime science advocate, a community organizer, a public engagement practitioner, and he's dedicated to engaging the public in science through interactive and informal settings. He serves as the science correspondent for Adam Savage's Tested.com. He was director of the Bay Area Science Festival and he founded the landmark San Francisco-based Science Cafe events called Down to a Science. He also starred BayAreaScience.org, an online portal of science-related events in the Bay Area. Kishore has an educational and professional background in science, including a degree in chemistry from UC Berkeley, and as co-founder of an environmental services company. And, is in, and Kishore has and does inspire countless new science communicators to use their voice. I am truly uh, delighted that they're both integral members of a larger network of collaborators, creating a community of learning and informed practice around the framework of civic science with the goal of shaping a more equitable and resilient future. So today, together with Media Impact Funders and many other connected efforts, we're creating this partnership with humility and a need to listen to different sources of knowledge, to share what we're learning with the broader community. From our many conversations with Karen and Kishore, I so look forward to their insights they'll share today uh, in this brief amount of time that we have together. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you in just two minutes, which is too short a time, what's on top of your mind now? And Karen, might you start? Of course, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so honored to be here. And what's up on the top of mind for me right now it really is um, how central and ubiquitous are the topics of racial equity and particularly what we're discussing today um, you know, people's perception understanding and attitudes of science um, particularly as you mentioned in the time of crisis we're living in um, a, a key belief of mine is that, that the lack of scientific knowledge or lack of access to scientific knowledge and research and training really translates and compounds uh, power inequities. And I, I learned this firsthand when I was working for the city and county of San Francisco, and I saw how community voice really struggled to be heard in this, by decision makers because they did not have access to science. Both literally, they could not hire a scientist or a, re a statistician to, to make their lived experience be heard. Uh, but also because they did not have access to being embedded in science as a, as, as a practice, as an, in the education a system, as a system. So this lack of access to science and scientific knowledge really became to, clear to me that it uh, perpetuates inequities um, in many spaces. And that is, that is top of my mind today. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for doing that so briefly. I really appreciate it. And Kishore, I know uh, we talked also that uh, you had maybe a, a story also to add. 
Yeah, I, I would say what's top of mind is uh, throughout our history, whenever there's been biomedical innovation as we're going to need to get through this pandemic, uh, we've seen a furthering of social inequality. And I, I was at a number of the Black Lives Matters protests over the last few weeks. And uh, one that I was at in San Francisco, I was uh, uh, I went with a number of doctors and students and nurses from UCSF where I formerly worked. Uh, and while the crowd was so appreciative to see frontline healthcare workers uh, out there standing with them, uh, we we met a uh, a woman that had lived in San Francisco in the Mission District for a long time, uh, and she came up to us and started talking to us about a scientist uh, that works at UCSF. And I've gone to a lot of protests. I you know I helped start the March for Science in 2017. Uh, this is the first time any protester has name checked a uh, a scientist and a professor to me uh, during a protest. Uh, but what she brought up was that this scientist had uh, been running studies where he um, uh, collected data on the African American community in San Francisco and really had essentially ghosted them. Um, and that feeling of feeling reduced to a data point and like that their own lived experience, that their own data was was sort of denied to them that uh that hurt that she was sharing and how that impacted her trust of science going forward was palpable in this short conversation uh and it reminded me of how much agency that members of our communities have and that they are engaged in what's going on i think oftentimes the story in science has been well people care about x y and z so much more whether it's the economy or healthcare or something else but I think there is pockets of, uh, of members of the community across this country that deeply care about science and are just looking for better opportunities to gauge alongside with us. And quite frankly, we're not going to get through uh, the current situations and the, and the crises of the future uh, without them together. Thank you, Short. That's such an important shift that you're pointing out and, and it, uh, lots in there, including how we think about evidence to include earned or lived knowledge uh, and, and the needed intersection between, between uh, 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 other, other types of evidence too. But uh, from your years on the front lines of science communication, we're going to ask you a couple questions, Kishore, and then mm -hmm. uh, turn to Karen as we've agreed. Uh, from your years on the front lines of science communication, what can you share about science communication help, what you know, it's historically been, and what changes do you see now that are beginning to shift as we start thinking about uh, more effectively uh, communicating? And really, the word is engaging, isn't it? Because we can't talk about communication now without engagement. Yeah, when I got started in science communication, I didn't have any gray on my face. So it's been a, I'm a grizzled veteran now, I think, according to some. Um, I, you know, I'll reflect back. I, I used to have a science and society podcast uh, through Mother Jones. And uh, we intentionally st uh, started it. Uh, this is a podcast that, that Chris Mooney and Indre Visconti started out. Um, Chris Mooney, the longtime envir uh, environmental reporter and climate reporter. Um, and we, uh, we unintentionally said uh, to the audience and, and to Mother Jones, like, we're going to focus on the intersection between science and social issues. But uh, as we went through it, we like, it was very clear, the audience wanted to hear science stories first. That's what they cared about. They wanted to hear from the scientists. They wanted a level of authority um, uh, uh, coming through. And historically, science communication, especially when you even just rewind the clock, a few years has focused on the the transfer of knowledge, uh, the education, the um, uh, the understanding of the the concepts and ideas, uh, and it was really clear to us when we when we really started to dig into the details that that's not where the growth needed to be. That's not where, as we peeled away the layers, uh, where the audience really wanted to go when given the right opportunity. Uh, and I'll, I'll bring up a specific example. So like it, during the, the Flint crisis, like Mother Jones was, was covering that extensively uh, and we were doing some coverage as well. And I was talking to um, a member of Mark Edwards team. He was the civil engineer at Virginia Tech who you know basically grabbed his lab of civil engineers. They jumped in a, a minivan and went to Flint and went door to door uh, listening to people uh, uh, at their kitchen tables about their experience with uh, with the water in Flint. Uh, and uh, I, I was talking to one of the, the team members and uh, it was so clear that uh, our audience needed him as a messenger to hear this because when we had tried to put on 
uh, members of the Flint community, they couldn't like, they couldn't wrap their head around the message that was being received. They couldn't like see the world through those eyes, even though those stories were immensely powerful about what they're seeing. But when they heard this engineer, this person that they had some level of blind trust in because of, of the, the kind of work that he was doing, they immediately shifted. And what he talked about wasn't necessarily like how the pipes are all connected and like and like the the science behind how the contamination happened. No, he talked about going to town hall meetings, um, and in this particular one where a community member was arrested uh, because uh, the city council didn't want her to to keep talking about the issues she was having with water and the experience of a scientist and an engineer sitting in the audience and seeing. Um, what he saw was democracy being sort of undermined in that moment. Uh, and what it, it told me is that, you know, we oftentimes in science communication have, have created this artifice of science over here, society over here, uh, and that, that gap is this in, incredible amount, uh, incredible uh, uh, gap that, that covers so many experiences. And when we shrink that, we have the uh, ability to tell incredibly powerful and rich stories uh, to audiences that are really looking for that type of messenger and authority. Uh, we should note that scientists remain one of the most trusted um, uh, roles in U.S. society, and it's been that way for a number of years. Um, in uh, recent times, uh, they've been just behind uh, military and firefighters uh, among the most trusted individuals in American society. And I believe since the start of the COVID pandemic, we've passed the military. Uh, so now we just have firefighters to overcome, I guess. Um, but the point of it was, is during that time, it was really clear how we needed to pair the storytelling that was already there um, from the community with the scientific expertise to reach a really particular audience. And that told me so much about the nature of the stories that we're trying to tell in science are less about spreading like the, the knowledge so that everyone is on the same plate, but more about being really specific about our targeting through our messenger and our message to who they reach based on the values and beliefs they hold. And thank you, Short. I'm, I have two more follow up for you. And, and that is, you know, as, as we think also uh, um, about the shifts, uh, not only trusted messenger, but also about creating uh, sort of meaningful uh, relationships with audiences, uh, there are some tools that are available uh, and some research that helps us uh, think how we can better make this um, connections, especially as we're getting increasingly polarized on, on issues such as climate change uh, and uh, many other science related uh, issues that are important to our society. Might you comment on that also? Yeah, if we rewind the clock just a few years, um, we often would talk about you know, uh, uh, America as having one perspective on science or one perspective on climate change. Uh, that started to rapidly change with um, Dan Kahan and the Yale cli uh, uh, Climate Communication Program's work on establishing that Six Americas uh, 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 landmark research report that really started to break down perspectives towards clients in different segments um, ba uh, based on long head attitudes, what their behavior is uh, to a certain extent. Um, we've undertaken similar research um, uh, at CZI looking at that through the lens of, uh, of science and uh, particularly biomedical research in the context of, of the COVID pandemic. And what we're seeing consistently over and over and over again from that initial report uh, that Yale led and has repeated over time is that there is not this massive anti uh, science or anti-climate movement. There is a small organized and outsized number of people that have uh, large views that tend to be amplified on social media. Um, but uh, at the same time, the majority of people fall into the, these realms where they're either under-engaged or not engaged on, on their terms. Uh, and really what we see is this ability to pair this really powerful data uh, with the uh, the storytelling and the messengers that already exist in the mar uh, in the market right now, and have our stories be really targeted to those that are going to be most receptive to it, based on who they are and what they believe in. We're not going to send that same scientist I was talking about in Flint to go talk to 
um, the, the Christian conservative in Texas who um, has had never had any relationship with a scientist or engineer in their life, their values just won't align. And so while we can do a lot of effort to make them talk to each other, uh, it's going to be a lot of effort. But there are a lot of messengers that are appropriate. And I think when we start to see this data-driven approach to engagement start to be paired with the people that are doing the work, the uh, effectiveness of these messages can rise. We're already seeing a lot of success um, a, in, the, in the climate community with this. I think the question now becomes, how do we scale this um, across science uh, so that science becomes a, a tool of the people uh, as opposed to a tool that scientists use to move our knowledge forward? Exactly. Now, now there's not nearly enough time, Kishore, to, to dip into your deep knowledge, but can you just very quickly, so we can segue to, to Karen too, and give her some time of just allude to what philanthropy can do to drive this uh, strategic work forward? Uh, I think it, it's, it's two simple things. Like we need to focus on people, not projects. Um, invest directly in the people that are doing this work um, and get out of their way. Uh, and then arm them with the kind of data they need to be more effective in what they do. Uh, and I think when we take that approach, we're going to drive innovation in terms of what is created and how it's created. Uh, and moreover, we're going to uh, bring together perspectives uh, and ideas uh, into uh, the, the kind of economy of science communication that we haven't seen before. And right now that's more needed than ever. Um, in fact, this moment, uh, during the pandemic is large is probably going to set people's perceptions of science for generations to come. So now is the moment to invest in those uh, in, in those people, a diverse cohort of people to really uh, uh, and to give them the tools to really get out there in the field and tell stories. Fantastic. And, and speaking of, since we all uh, are investing in civic science fellows, let us introduce a and turn over to, and thank you so much, Kishore, a phenomenal uh, uh, star, I think uh, one of our fellows, to Karen, to uh, tell us a little bit more about what it's like being part of the inaugural cohort of uh, fellows and what uh, drew you to, to uh, this work and then perhaps pivoting, uh, how you see the pivot uh, point in science communication. Perhaps you could combine both of those, uh, Karen, thanks. Yes. Yes, uh, well, I am so happy and proud to be part of the civic science uh, inaugural cohort. It really feels like a home that I was searching for for a long time. Um, as you said, I'm an environmental health researcher, and I always had two feet, uh, one in the research and doing the lab work and doing the big omics work, but also um, in, in getting that understanding, but also being really concerned and really thinking about the role of science in society. Um, and so uh, to me, actually, I, 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 what drew me to civic science was, I feel like this is something that has always been core to who I am. Um, as I mentioned in, the, in what was top of my mind, I've always felt, uh, as long as I can remember, that was wondering how, when does science hit the road? When does it actually get into the hands of people, um, for them to have the, the agency to change their world and their communities. Um, and so I started a, a work at UC Berkeley, as, as you mentioned briefly, starting a, a, just a, a model to show both students and professors and community connecting, connecting community research questions to researchers in the academy. And this synergy, the synergy that I saw happen there was really uh, pointed me to the potential for collaborative, collaborative growth, uh, for sharing of power and knowledge, and how that really helped build um, in the, the, towards the promise of a, more, um, of a more just society. And that's, for me, the, that's why civic science matters to me, and that's why I am so happy to be here. And, and I think I completely agree with Kishore that for me, the, the current pivot in science communication is that we're starting to grapple how do we actually, how do we make inclusive spaces where people can both receive the information, but also make the relationships that really start to change perspectives and empower them to not only have a voice, but also to take action in their communities. To me, that's, that's the big pivot um, that, I, I, that I see happening and that I'm so happy is happening. Karen, uh, we of course uh, are um, uh, running a little bit behind, but I want to ask you one last question before we wrap up, and that is as we speak to the science engagement along this arc, you know, who's doing this kind of science engagement work and who do we need to bring to the table? I think this is a really important note to, to kind of then conclude our, our segment. Thank you. 
Yes, I think that um, when you when I, I, I then when I think of this, I think a lot of the of the fact that, for example, I experience science as a very difficult place, um, um, and and I as I'm becoming going through you know from undergrad to grad school to getting the PhD to having the postdocs, as you said. Um, I, I feel that I believe, I strongly believe that we need to do work in the, in, in look at the internal legacies that we practice in practices that perpetuate racism, sexism, and many other ills in the institutions. And that will then make that inclusive space. And for the, for the voices, I think that the voices that are missing are really the voices of, of as I mentioned in, in earlier too, the, the, the anecdotes giving and rice the, the important lived experience of the many people that are are not in the room um the you know from the migrant worker to the to the to many other people that we don't traditionally listen to and and to really sort of frame this like this not from us necessarily from us sharing power but also making space for communities and thinking about the additive and incremental uh the, the, how their voice will add to our power and our knowledge and the in the beauty of the of our spaces and our work to me that that's that's the voices that we and the in the approach that we need to be taking to to bring more people into the conversation thank you karen so much and uh would you add your your final uh question that i was going to ask you about uh from your perspective on the role of philanthropy at the civic science ecosystem perhaps into our chat box so i can conclude by uh saying that in this uh, uh, brief amount of time, we are indeed very grateful to you, Kishore and Karen, for, for the uh, issues that you've uh, brought forward. We certainly thank Media Impact Funders for creating a community to look closely at these critical, complex, and intersecting issues and look forward to continuing the conversation today and beyond, as well as the rest of the program today. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and I should note that um, Elizabeth is also chair of our program committee, so she really helps us to shape all of our programming uh, with the high level um, oversight of, of, of that work. And this session today is supposed to especially help us shape our, the, the programming for the coming year, where in our learning agenda, we've highlighted the importance of science communications and evidence-based information in shaping the public debate. So hopefully we can all encourage um, everyone who's listening to, uh, to, to share ideas with us on how we can better shape our programming before. I'm so happy that we had the conversation that you just um, uh, moderated, Elizabeth. Uh, it's something that echoes, I think, what we've been hearing throughout the forum, the importance of addressing racial justice, that racial justice is tied to environmental justice, and, and that the impacts of climate are going to be unevenly distributed to affect uh, communities of color and and in other ways, um, you know, call for climate justice as well. And so we know that these issues are interlaced. That was certainly clear from the first person we heard from in the, in the forum when Amy Goodman interviewed Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. Uh, and we also heard uh, similar um, themes uh, addressed in your own programming, the civic science uh, uh, Zoom conference discussions that you're conducting parallel to this. Um, just the most recent one was was quite uh, il illuminating on these topics as well, and, and we'll post links to that as well in the chat. But now we're going to turn to lessons we've learned at the Frank Gathering. One of the last trips we were able to take when we were still traveling was our annual pilgrimage to Gainesville, where the Frank Gathering brings together the most amazing public interest communications experts, academics, um, practitioners, um, foundation representatives, uh, and we love to go to Gainesville for that gathering. And we heard several really interesting presentations, three of whom we're gonna hear from today. And to, to lead us in that discussion, Annie Neiman, the Director of Research uh, at, um, uh, for, at the Center for Public Interest Communications at the College of Journalism and Communications at the University of Florida, is gonna moderate this section and the lessons we learn from research in communications will also help to illuminate the, the third uh, discussion as well. And I'll come back to, uh, to, to mention a little bit about that as well. But now I'm gonna ask Annie Neiman to take over from here. Thank you, Vince. And thank you, Elizabeth. That was so 
fascinating and I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, at the center, we believe that increasing engagement with science to help solve society's pressing challenges requires that we apply insights from science to the stories we tell and how we communicate to build community engagement. And this is particularly true in this hyperpolarized moment with our tendencies to pick sides based off of our identities, encroaching into matters of public health, freedom to live without fear of police violence, and the looming point of no return we face with climate change. This moment requires science that can help guide us forward. And at our Frank gathering this year, which as Vin said, is a gathering for change makers, we heard from three scientists whose inspired work call us to think about how we build a, uh, build a culture of civic science. We'll hear from them today. Their work helps us imagine new ways of engaging communities to build the world we wish existed. So first we'll hear from Dr. Davin Phoenix. Uh, Dr. Phoenix is an assistant professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine, and he studies the intersection of race, politics, and emotion. Then we'll hear from Dr. Gordon Kraft Todd. Um, Dr. Kraft Todd is a postdoctoral fellow at Boston College, and his research examines the impact of messengers on our willingness to engage in environmental action. And lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Katherine Dale. Dr. Dale is an assistant professor at Florida State University. She studies how we experience self-transcendent emotions in media like awe and what it can inspire us to do. So to get started, uh, we know from research that people often make decisions and judgments based on emotion. And we know that different emotions like awe, hope, pride, fear, anger, and grief motivate us to do different things. Dr. Phoenix, your research supports this finding and gives it deeper nuance, suggesting that different emotions motivate, motivate us based on race. Can you tell us more about your research? Thank you, Annie, and uh, hello, everyone. I was like, we're gonna share screen. So as we think about people encountering urgent, pressing, even generation-defining issues, such as climate change, we may hope they respond with a sentiment akin to the lines of Howard Beale in the classic 1976 film, Network. Uh, let's see. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. And that quote resonates with how political psychologists uh, tend to view anger working to shape behavior. Anger makes people less risk averse. It makes them more confident in their actions and more impulsive. Thus, it's very effective at moving people off of the sidelines and onto the playing field, increasing people's motivation to engage in civic and political actions, such as canvassing for candidates or issues, uh, contacting local officials, attending meetings and town halls, or partnering with uh, community groups to address pressing concerns all the kinds of actions that we hope people take to address environmental issues. But there's a catch. In my work, I find that people who generally occupy socially or politically marginalized positions in the US, uh, specifically people of color, Black, Latinx, and Asian American folks, uh, don't respond to these pressing issues with the same amount of action motivating anger as their white counterparts. Now, why is this? A primary reason is that these groups typically do not possess the same confidence in their collective agency or confidence in their influence over political outcomes. And so without that sense of control within their environment, rather than respond to these pressing issues with anger, they're more likely to respond with something more akin to resignation, and that doesn't move them off the sidelines. So that finding is particularly relevant in the domain of climate change because across racial lines and across the social political spectrum, people often feel that they have little to no influence over this big, seemingly intractable issue. And so that pervasive sense that one's actions matter little in the grand scheme can sap one of that sense of indignation, sap one of that motivational pull to right that wrong and stem the tide of increased global warming. But my work shows that there is a viable pathway to compel meaningful action on pressing issues like this, even from people who find their impact is often ineffectual. Rather than seeking to get them mad as hell, we can give them something to feel proud about or something to feel hopeful for, and that can motivate increased civic and political action among people who often feel marginalized. The feeling of pride enhances one's sense of self-efficacy and sparks a joy that motivates one to stay the course of action. Meanwhile, hope enhances people's capacity to imagine new possibilities, and it drives them to put in the work to bring that future vision to pass. So we can imagine the responses to calls to action on climate change that don't solely emphasize the scope of the issue or the chilling consequences, but rather calls to emphasize the real power that everyday people possess to make headway on this issue through sustained collective action. 
calls that lay out a promising vision for not only how robust action on climate change can have profound impacts on our, on our environment, but also how it can address related ills as we were speaking, such as environmental racism, and also expand economic opportunities. So framing our appeals to act on climate change with the understanding that pride and hope compel action among those who can often feel skeptical about their influence, that can open up new pathways for people to move from the sideline into the field of urgent participation. Thank you. I, I so appreciate the nuance that you give to this conversation about the role of emotion in motivating us. And, and I think your research pushes us to, to acknowledge where the communities are when we seek to engage them. And if they feel like they lack agency or power, then we can use emotion with intention to bring them in. That's incredible. Absolutely. I think it's really critical for us to recognize that people aren't simply responding to threat messaging, right, in terms of urgency. We want to convey a real genuine opportunity, and I think the other speakers will speak to this, right, for people to make some headway, to make some real progress. You can't just give people the, pro uh, the problem without giving some kind of blueprint or pathway for a solution. Right. And increase their feeling of power. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so it is also well known that messengers play a critical role in mobilizing communities. We've, we've heard a little bit about that today. Effective messengers are seen as trustworthy, credible, and authentic. Dr. Kraft Todd, your research builds on this body of research and tells us that we can also identify effective messengers by the actions they take. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, and while I'm sharing my screen here, uh, I just want to say what an effective messenger uh, Annie is for the Frank Gathering for folks who are on the call who haven't seen the Frank Gathering. Uh, she mentioned that the three of us are joining, but there were, I was very honored to be among this host of amazing scientists and activists, and um, I can't say enough good things about Frank, so uh, check it out. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm excited to tell you all about some work uh, that I've um, been doing that's inspired by the phrase, actions speak loud in the words. So we've probably all heard that before, but um, why, there we go, why is it true? Um, so if we were in person, I would do this uh, in a demonstration, but I'll just ask you to do a sort of thought experiment. Um, so imagine I had two sort of like bags of mushrooms, um, actual mushrooms with me, and I said, um, you know that one of them, one bag of mushrooms is poisonous and the other is not, but you don't know which is which. Um, now I'll ask all of you listening to imagine what you would do if I, if I just told you that the mushrooms that you see on the left are not poisonous, whether you would come up and try one of the mushrooms, again, if we were in person. Um, and then the key part is that if I were to eat one of the mushrooms, uh, then I would ask again for everyone listening, if you would imagine coming up uh, and trying one of the mushrooms then. Um, so hopefully this gives you sort of uh, primes your intuition for this explanation that I'm about to give. Um, but why do actions speak loud in the words? Basically, we all know that talk is cheap. Um, so when I just tell you which mushroom is not poisonous, um, all you have to go on is your trust in me. However, our actions can be costly. So when you see me eat the mushroom, then you know that I believe that it's not poisonous because if it were, that could be really bad for me. So in some why do actions speak loud in the words, um, because our actions are costly, they're a more honest signal of our beliefs. So in the context uh, that I'm gonna present this research on, I don't need to uh, tell you all that the, the globe is warming. Uh, and there are many things that individuals can do to address this. And one of them is to install solar panels on your home. So my collaborators and I went to the state of Connecticut and we partnered with the Solarize Connecticut campaign, which is a community organization campaign encouraging folks to install solar panels in their homes. Uh, and this was a, a huge undertaking of which I was a very small part um, in partnership with a bunch of other organizations. Um, and a key part of the Solarize Connecticut campaign were the community organizers themselves who are called solar ambassadors, represented by this goofy mascot. Um, and there were a number of things that the solar ambassadors did to try to get people uh, excited about solar panels. So for example, having open houses to show people what it's like to have solar panels in your home, uh, town hall meetings 
to answer people's questions. Um, and we wanted to know what made these solar ambassadors more effective at getting people to install solar. So there's lots of characteristics of individuals that you might think would affect their uh, effectiveness. For example, what sort of messaging do they use? Um, do they have sort of pro-environmental beliefs themselves? How wealthy are they maybe? What's their gender? These are sort of variables that people look at um, a bunch. But we also wanted to explore this hypothesis about whether actions speak loud in the words. And so to do that, we just simply grouped the community organizers into two groups, um, those who had solar panels in their house already and those who did not. Um, so now you'll see the data here on the y-axis are the average number of people in the towns who installed solar panels through the Solarize Connected program. On the x-axis, there are just the two groups for the solar ambassadors who had solar panels already and did not. Um, and as you can see, there was a, a large significant effect on the order of 63% uh, more people signed up to get solar panels in the towns where the ambassador had solar panels already compared to the towns where the ambassador did not. So we did actually measure all of these other variables, but none of them turned out to predict the effectiveness of the ambassadors. The only thing that was uh, significantly uh, predicted their success was whether the ambassadors had solar panels themselves. Now this was a, a, a field study, a sort of correlational study. We didn't manipulate anything, so we wanted to replicate this observation and have more confidence in the causality by doing a number of um, online experiments, uh, of which we did three with about 1,800 people. And we also wanted to show that it didn't just apply to installing solar panels, but to other kinds of behaviors that individuals can do to uh, combat climate change. For example, buying carbon offsets for flights, uh, xeriscaping your lawn, which means replacing a grass lawn with more sustainable ground cover like gravel or uh, succulents, buying consumer goods used instead of new, uh, and finally, actually very relevant now, but uh, when we ran the study a couple years ago, it, uh, it was, came out of left field a little bit, uh, wearing a face mask when you're sick with a cough or the flu in public. Um, so the takeaway message here is if you're looking for ambassadors to represent a cause like Greta Thunberg for climate change, and you want people to really know what these ambassadors believe, you can try to recruit people who do uh, actions that are consistent with these beliefs rather than just um, saying the words. So like uh, Greta taking the boat instead of the plane to the um, UN summit. Uh, that's it, thanks. Great, thank you. And I say this with love, I appreciate your cheesy graphics. <laughs> um, thank you. I feel like your research is so obvious, but also like I, I think it's really important for strategists to remember like when you are activating messengers, do they walk the walk? They might be environmentalists, but are they living the life of an environmentalist? And your research says that there's, that's something that we need to think about as we build these advocates who go out and and fight for the world that we wish existed so thank you so much for that yeah absolutely and uh, just one little point that uh because we also think it's kind of obvious but um had the you know had the organizers of this campaign for example thought that in advance they may have recruited more ambassadors who had solar panels already but in fact only about 33 percent of the community organizers did so mm -hmm. i think that's you know even though it seems obvious that's like a great sort of you know, practical organizing principle that you can, if, if you're advocating for a specific behavior, have people who have done it represent you. Right. It's a characteristic that um, builds authenticity and credibility. Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Um, so um, thinking about emotion again, we know that awe is really powerful and it's an underutilized emotion. Um, but awe opens us up to new perspectives and can inspire us to be gracious with our time. Dr. Dale, you study awe-inspiring content, and you recently found that awe can have an impact on us whether we personally experience it or we witness someone else experiencing it. Can you tell us more about your research and this finding? Thanks, Annie. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. So my research focuses on self-transcendent emotions, including awe. Now, when we talk about awe and awesome things, what exactly do we mean? And what happens when we experience awe? 
So today I'm going to talk about the elicitors and the effects of awe and what might happen when we see these things depicted in the media. So awe is described as an emotional experience and Keltner and Haidt describe it as being on the upper reaches of pleasure and on the boundary of fear. Now a key defining aspect of awe is that the stimulus is vast and requires accommodation. Now this vastness can be both physically vast, like stars in the night sky, um, or it can be anything that we experience as much larger than the self, um, something that's outside of our normal frame of reference. Now, when we encounter something that is awe-inspiring, this normal frame of reference needs to be adjusted. This expansion can feel enlightening um, as we expand our mental structures to accommodate this new understanding. So when we go outside and we stand under this incredible night sky uh, and we feel very small next to it, next to all these tens of thousands of stars, this is awe. So what happens when we feel awe? What happens when we have these sort of mind-blowing experiences? Well, research has found that awe can make us more willing to help other people. It can make us uh, less impatient. It can make us more satisfied with life. Um, and one really cool thing that people have found is that by bringing us into the present, it can actually make us feel time differently, making us feel like we have more time. Now, this is great, right? So experiencing awe can make us want to help other people. It can make us feel more satisfied with life. It, it, it seems like maybe we should just all go out and experience all more often. Um, visit the Grand Canyon, you know, stand at the side of it, um, feel small next to it, just soak in the glory of it. But, and research says that we will be better for this. Um, and this would be wonderful if we could do this, but it's really not feasible for many people, especially during our current pandemic situation. So one way that we might have awe-inspiring experiences is through media exposure. Now, a couple of years ago, a team of researchers and myself set out to explore the contents and effects of inspirational media. So we were specifically looking for elicitors of self-transcendent emotions. Self-transcendent emotions are any emotion that takes us outside of ourselves, including awe. So we systematically went through this media content looking for elicitors of um, self-transcendent emotions, including awe. So some things that might inspire awe um, are in addition to vast stimuli, we have um, extraordinary skill or talent, music, art, incredible architecture like the Taj Mahal or Westminster Abbey, um, or nature like the Grand Canyon. And also watching someone else experience awe can inspire those same feelings in ourselves. So this project was a little bit difficult because elicitors of self-transcendent emotions and awe are very idiosyncratic. What evokes these emotions in one person might not necessarily elicit them in another. So when we were examining this content, we had to be very careful not to judge the extent to which we personally believed that these depictions were awe-inspiring um, or likely to elicit a self-transcendent emotion. So we also allowed for the co-presence of elicitors. So here's an example um, of a piece of content where there were a lot of different elicitors present at the same time. So in this particular um, news segment, this was a man who spends his day carving these amazingly large and artistically ornate sandstone caves, um, just for the joy of it. So in this, in this particular photos here, we see nature, um, we see skill, we see vastness, and we see art all at the same time. And what we found in this content analysis was that elicitors of self-transcendent emotions are frequent in inspirational content. Notably though, the elicitors associated with both awe and hope appeared the most frequently. However, the nature of content analysis is such that while this particular research method can tell us about the content itself, it can't actually tell us if people think these things are inspiring. So we did a follow-up study where we had people come into a lab um, and watch inspirational videos. And they had these little dials that looked like remotes. And when they were feeling inspired, they turned the dial up and when they were feeling less inspired, they turned the dial back down. So if you were taking part in the study right now and you were inspired by the photo of the Grand Canyon, you may have turned the dial up and then back down when you were no longer feeling that same inspiration. And when we analyzed our results, what we found were that these elicitors, when these elicitors of self-transcendent emotions were shown on screen, people did turn their dials up. Um, this tells us that these depictions are actually eliciting feelings of inspiration in audience members. 
So what does all of this mean? First of all, it tells us that elicitors of self-transcendent emotions, and including awe and hope, are common in inspirational content. The second thing is that it shows that media exposure can lead to experiences of awe. Now this run, runs counter to the dominant narrative that media consumption is somehow bad or inherently negative. There is excellent research that has demonstrated that media and social media can have negative effects, but positive media psychology research is also finding that it can have positive effects, um, that we can experience awe and hope and admiration and a host of other self-transcendent emotions when we consume media. So as we've discussed, feelings of awe can make us wanna engage in pro-social behaviors, like helping others, um, and then it can also make us feel more satisfied in life. And the possibility that we can experience awe and the benefits of this emotion um, as a result of media is really pretty great, particularly when we are in a time when we can't all just go out to the Grand Canyon right now. So there's still a great deal that we don't know about the way we might experience awe as a result of the media, but we're starting to understand that media experiences that result in awe can lead to positive personal and social outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry for the screaming uh, infant in the background. She just got home. Um, but I really appreciate, appreciate this conversation, especially as we think about stories we tell about science when so often, especially stories about climate change, tend to, fall on, tend to rely on apocalyptic narratives and create feelings of guilt or shame or fear. I think your research tells us that we should look for these stories that inspire these self-transcendent emotions because they can motivate us to take action in the interest of the, in the, in the environment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you all for these incredible insights. Um, there are so many insights we can learn from research that we can use to build campaign strategies to engage people in science. And I think the folks at Exposure Labs do incredible work telling stories about climate change that pull on a range of emotions and include authentic messengers. Um, from my perspective, they're doing some of the greatest work that reflects the best of what we know from science. Um, and their work certainly inspires awe. So um, before we jump into our next segment, let's take a look at some of the work coming from Exposure Labs. We're just observers, these two little dots on the side of the mountain. We watched and recorded the largest witness caving event ever caught on tape. So how big was this caving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. Thank you. I, that clip actually inspired fear. <laughs> but I, what, uh, what you, I think you would see in um, the trailer for the Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral are big, beautiful landscape um, images that inspire awe. And as we take the per perspective of the protagonists and we witness these spaces from their perspective, we experience awe through their eyes, uh, similar to what uh, Catherine was sharing. Um, so I'm excited to welcome uh, Mega Sood, Director of Programs at Exposure Lab, to talk with us a bit more about their work. Hi, Mega. How's it going? Good. It's always so great to be in conversation with you, Annie. <laughs> yes. I'm always so happy when we get to be together. <laughs> I'm a super fan. Um, so, Mega, your team has done incredible work bringing emotions like awe into its storytelling. What, ha what have the impacts of using these various emotions been um, that you've seen? Yeah, it's, um, you know, for those 
um, who are not familiar with the film Chasing Ice, which is where that clip was from. It's directed by Jeff Orlowski, and he follows National Geographic photographer James Baylog to set up time-lapse cameras to create, um, show visual evidence of how the earth is rapidly changing. And as you mentioned, it really is um, awe striking to see these landscapes in, in that way. Um, and after one of our screenings, when we we're just rolling out the film, our team met um, a viewer named Lolly. And I want to share this clip um, in terms of just showing what was her reaction to the film. I saw this movie, Chasing Ice, today. And it, it hasn't just changed me about global warming, it has changed me as a person. And there is something, I don't know what I can do. I'm 60 years old, but there must be something I can do to help this, to help our children, to help my grandkids. But I'm going to change it because this movie was fantastic. Every human being in this world should watch this movie. Everyone. And you didn't believe in global warming? I did not believe in global warming. I am going to be 60 on December 21. And every time someone mentioned global warming to me, I told them if they wanted to remain in my home, they needed to step out. Because I said it was bull****. I didn't believe it. Excuse my language. And that is because I listen. And I, this is the truth. I believe Bill Riley. And now you saw this movie. And I saw this movie. And I apologize to anyone I ever talked into not into believing there was no global warming. I have talked to every friend, every person I know into believing there is no global warming. And now I have to undo my damage. And I will. For the moment I go to my car, go home, go to my computer, it has changed my life. Wow, that's great. That's thank really you. cool. I, thank you for giving me this moment. It was a great movie. Lolly actually came to the film screening to heckle us, right? And I, seeing her reaction really um, gave the team insight into the power of awe to actually change hearts and minds. Um, you know, and I think this notion really influenced the director, Jeff Orlowski, and how he approached his second feature doc, The Chasing Coral, but also really helped Exposure Labs as a team realize and the power of storytelling to reach new communities who often don't see themselves as part of the climate movement and how actually really powerful storytelling can inspire them to act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can hear it in her voice how powerful that emotional experience must have been for her, uh, which must have been quite a different experience than if you all had just simply featured scientists or shared data points. So we know we need lots of uh, stories with lots of different emotions. Um, and characters that we can connect with and resonate with. Can you tell us about how you all at Exposure Labs are supporting those stories? Yeah, so we know how crucial storytellers are in framing how society understands some of the biggest crises of our time, like climate change, like the pandemic, and also the power of storytelling for us to understand the solutions and how to address these crises. But we have to ask ourselves, why haven't we actually built the political will for meaningful climate action? What is not going well in climate storytelling? So just take a moment right now to think about some of the biggest, most popular climate stories of the past decade. Most likely, you'll start to see a pattern of films that amplify trusted messengers who are white men from the global north. And we got together with our good friends and mentors at the Doc Society and asked ourselves, where is everyone else's stories? You know, there's no such thing as a silver bullet film that's gonna solve a climate emergency. What we really need is an explosion of stories that can reach different audiences. Of course, like everyone hopes that their stories are seen by as many people as possible. But usually a storyteller is inspired to tell a story because they want it to reach a specific audience. And how do we really help that make that happen? So with Doc Society, we actually recently launched the Climate Story Lab, which is an initiative that brings together storytellers across all mediums, from documentaries, to podcasts, to magazines, and poetry series, and mixes them up in a heady brew with climate scientists, researchers, political strategists, faith leaders, comedians, and grassroots organizers. 
Um, and as Michael Primo, who's a filmmaker of Water Warriors, and I believe he's also spoken at the Media Impact Funders Forum before too, he so beautifully said at the lab, what we need is a biodiversity of stories as diverse as the ecosystem we seek to save. The Climate Story Lab is really an opportunity for, uh, for our community of storytellers and practitioners to really ask ourselves, who is telling the story? How is the story being told? Who is funding it? And how is the story being amplified? It's been really fascinating hearing the work of all the tremendous, like, uh, tremendous researchers and scientists that have been on this call and starting to realize that so many of the projects that have been part of the Climate Story Lab cohort um, really align with the research. We knew that there was something really special about these stories, but we didn't have like the language or the framing to really articulate why we felt like they were so special and why we felt like they were so needed. Mm -hmm. And I, I love what you're saying that it's not that we need a diverse set of stories with the different emotions, but that we also have to be really intentional with the messengers who are in those stories and um, ensure that we're connecting the right messenger to the right audience. And we heard from Dr. Kraft Todd that messengers matter for bringing people into movements. Are there any examples from the Climate Story Lab that you think embody this message? Yeah, the first film that comes to mind is Greener Pastures. It is directed by Sam Miro, a really talented young filmmaker who grew up in the Midwest. Um, and this film, which is still in production, is an intimate portrait of four American families who are exploring the rise of suicide rates and growing mental health issues among Midwestern farmers. Um, so we're gonna play a little bit of a, a small clip from um, the story. All right, can you turn around? Like all the way or just? <laughs> <laughs> no, just turn around, face okay. the back, okay. okay. And I need you to scream as though you're on fire whenever you're ready. Go all out. All right. Oh my God, I'm on fire! Do you have any questions? Nope. Okay. So probably make a decision by the end of the week. Sounds good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't know if I believe so much in climate change as I do, but I would actually call it climate shift. I looked at the last three or four years of crops and the weather patterns, and we're in the same weather pattern, but it's like the old saying used to be April showers bring May flowers and I almost think like they should make it May flowers bring June flowers because like the rainy season isn't April anymore. I don't know that I believe all this over hoopla on some of this stuff, but I definitely think there's something going on with mother nature. The main participants in the film Greener Pastures are farmers who are advocates for policies that address climate change or climate shift, as he said in the clip. Um, you know, when we had the Climate Story Lab in London earlier this year, we were joined by the research organization More in Common, and they were sharing their work about Forgotten France, um, where they've identified that there are communities who've been, you know, experiencing economic hardships for multiple generations. They're really concerned about the climate about wildlife and wild places disappearing, they see potential for jobs in the green transition, but they feel excluded from the climate movement. They don't see anyone with their values and perspectives who are advocating for it. They don't align with the young protesters who've taken to the streets. They feel patronized by politicians and other climate activists. So what's happened is that they've just disengaged instead. What we're really curious about is how might we really harness the power of storytelling to build bridges with those who've been left behind. Um, and I think a lot of the work around trusted messengers really provide amazing concrete examples of things to understand, not only just in terms of um, the storytelling, but also as organizers use this as a tool to be able to build bridges um, in advancement of climate action. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Dr. Phoenix's work tells us that communities are inspired to action by different emotions, 
um, and that race, politics, and emotions intersect. How have the films that are part of Climate Story Lab used a variety of emotions to reach uh, diverse and specific communities? Yeah, it's great. You know, it's, again, when you look back at some of the most popular climate films of the past decade, many of them fall into this like emotional pattern, one that was noted earlier today, where it's just like, you know, fear, 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 and maybe a little bit of hope at the end, <laughs> or just fear and more apocalyptic fear. And studies show that people already feel pretty terrible when thinking about the climate. And so why have we accepted such a binary choice of just hope and fear in our stories? Um, at the first Climate Story Lab that we had in New York, we were joined by team members of the Hip Hop Caucus, which is an incredible organization who I has also spoken with the media impact funders. Um, but they really creatively use media as a way to elevate the need for climate and environmental justice. And while they were at the lab, they actually had an opportunity to meet a group of professional comedians from the Center for Media and Social Impact, which is led by Katie Borum Charu. And they started a conversation about what would it look like if they were to work with professional comedians and talk about climate change. And so they got together and launched a comedy variety special in Norfolk, Virginia called Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave. And we're gonna play a really short clip from the documentary that really captured that journey. After Hurricane Katrina, if you can go to a place that was just like that, that was below sea level, that had the same economic disparity, that if they were hit by a category one storm, it would have more disastrous effects. I said, well, where is that place? I'll be there. My son was born in 95. He's 24 now. He's just starting to get life. Is he really thinking about climate change? So comedy, I think, will help reach younger people that's not really thinking about it. That's the best way. We're here doing a climate crisis event. My name is Mamadou Njai, uh, if you were wondering. And if you're white, my name is unpronounceable. Uh, <laughs> you've seen her on BuzzFeed, Viceland, Amina, Imani. Ah, I gotta make climate change funny. Wow, I think that's the joke. I was like, oh. <laughs> we have someone who's been on you know, as we look at the range of climate stories that are being told, it's really an opportunity for asking ourselves, like, where is also the joy, the courage, the curiosity? Where are, like, the operas, the romances, and the comedies? Why are they all missing from climate stories? And why is the climate always missing from these other stories? Climate mm -hmm. is the context that these stories actually exist in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that you're saying, wh where's the romance? Where's the comedy? Where's the joy? And if you think about it, like, what, is, what are we all binging as we try to uh, survive this pandemic? We're probably binging comedies and romance and, and seeking out emotional experiences that make us feel good. So I totally agree that we should think about, well, what do people actually want to feel? And what would motivate them to engage with content and humor, comedy, joy, romance? I think is exactly right. Um, lastly, the work of Exposure Labs reflects the best of what we know from research from my perspective. Um, yet your team didn't always have access to a sociologist or a social psychologist or a communication scholar for your decision making. So how can we as a sector of scientists and funders and advocates uh, more intentionally connect, connect artists, strategists, and researchers to design campaigns for impact? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, um, you know, Annie, I remember when our team first had the opportunity to meet you and you told us about Dr. Dale's work on awe in reference to both Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral. And we were like, oh, <laughs> that's why these films are having these type of emotional experiences for our viewers. And it's easy to see the patterns like retroactively, but actually how can we be more proactive about it? I really, you know, the conversation today is really helping me think about like how do we actually partner more with researchers to have better insight into what is needed and what is not working. 
you know, it can really inform how these stories are developed, but also how do we design impact campaigns to ensure that the stories are actually meeting their intended audiences. And then as Dr. Phoenix also alluded to, like how do we actually craft call to actions that like lead to longstanding collective movement? Um, you know, and I, I think working with researchers can really help us identify like if we want to engage those beyond like the environmental choir, what stories need to be told? And how do we ensure that both funders and distributors and other decision makers are recognize the importance of elevating these stories? Um, stories like Greener Pastures and Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave may or may not be the next Marvel film, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not important to tell. And so I think what would be really amazing, and I want to basically follow up with everyone that's been on this call, is partnering with y'all to really help uh, us explain why these stories are so important to support so that in the end we truly can build the political will for climate action. I love that and I you as we were preparing for this you were telling me about your old uh, your old position at IDEO and how every team had a sociologist uh, thinking through the challenges and I just love the idea of more of bringing research and practice and art together to design with more intention and rather than um, relying on instinct and tradition, um, we, can, we can work with researchers to provide that gut check and sort of tell us where our blind spots are and how we could be more efficient in designing campaigns based off of how the mind works and how behavior works, so. Yeah, and my closing thought, Vince, I know we have to wrap, but to say I think what's what's so amazing about that, Annie, is, you know, we recognize that funders have been really supportive of us in terms of, like, helping to write the funding for the right, like, measurement and evaluation tactics to support the campaigns that we do, but what it would it be like for funders to also be able to support us to work with sociologists throughout both the production and our impact campaigns, because at the end of the day, it's just going to help us all reach the same goal that we're working towards, so. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And thank you Media Impact Funders for hosting this conversation and featuring the work of some of my favorite scientists, scientists whose work I hope ends up in all of your campaigns. And thank you, Mega, for the amazing inspo from Exposure Labs, as always. Great, thank you, Andy, for expertly moderating both of those discussions. Um, I think we're gonna bring everybody else on screen. Uh, I mean, all the panelists back on screen. We have one question in the queue. We're gonna invite John to come on in a minute. I also am struck by what a dialogue there has been across these program segments. And so I wanna invite our panelists, if they have a comment or a question about each other's that was sparked by each other's um, remarks, um, you might think about that as well. We have time for a little bit of um, questions and discussion. Um, I have one quick um, inquiry of Davin Phoenix, um, all of your research is sort of prior to the most recent uh, uprising um, sparked by the horrific murder of George Floyd. And so I just wonder if there's any sort of countervailing argument. Is there, is there an example of where sort of anger and that passion has been effective and if you might address that, that this is an exception to what you have um, seen otherwise. Sure. So I painted a pretty incomplete picture of the overarching argument. So while I'm not finding it, I'm finding that anger is not motivating people of color, specifically African Americans, towards civic and political actions, there's one exception, and that's the domain of protests and system challenging actions, right? So what we're seeing on display is the latest groundswell. And I speak to uh, that. I devote a whole chapter to that, actually, that the way in which black anger over politics, over the system, often translates towards uh, a very entrenched skepticism about change within the system or regime change, kind of creating the kinds of liberation or transformational change that many people desire. And so oftentimes when you do see black people get angry, it is going to be directed not towards the polling place, but to the front lines of protest. So I think that's something that's really important to understand. A lot of people are asking me about how this is going to translate to uh, the election in November. And I'm saying it's not going to be an automatic translation because a lot of that same frustration that's on display, we can look at Minneapolis as the epicenter, right, for this current groundswell of unrest. Many of those same folks on the ground were organizing and protesting in 2016 after the death of Flando Castillo, right? So that is further reinforcing that sense of skepticism, right? Whether, whether it's under Obama or under Trump, 
regardless of the local regime, we still have these entrenched issues. So yeah, if I can tell a bigger picture of the story, right? It's in thinking about how we're making these calls to actions of groups and saying, look what you stand to lose. That might fall on deaf ears because you say they say, well, you're not actually offering me a pathway to change that's any more viable than what I have now. I'm looking to radically transform the whole system. And that's when you can get into a lot of these different kind of ideological clashes amongst people that might broadly align on wanting change, but differ very greatly in their level of confidence in what avenues of change are or are not possible. Can I just ask you to elaborate one point, and that is in a in a moment that is so volatile and where the power is sort of coming up through, through the streets, it's probably hard to modulate the signals, right? But is there a way of weaving both the uplifting, practical, you know, positive with the righteous anger that is totally justifiable? Yeah, I try to articulate ways in which people that are looking to advocate or be responsive to the group can offer credible signals, right, that can instill or engender some mixture of that exasperation with pride and hope, right? We don't need to look at any of these emotions as completely, um, you know, kind of zero sum. They can be in combination. And so I think about how oftentimes, and I argue within the research, black displays of anger are given a level of scrutinization and surveillance and stigmatization that don't come from other groups. And so a simple fact of kind of mainstream civic or community political leaders taking the time to validate that anger and to legitimize it and to say, hey, we get why you're feeling this way, I think can actually engender some of that pride because so often the people that are choosing to act on that anger are so kind of resigned to the idea that they're going to be bracketed off and they're not going to be kind of given that same platform that they think they deserve that is demanded. So I argue like, you know, for mainstream political figures locally and nationally, they simply take the time to say, we get why you're angry. We're angry with you. We're angry for you. I think can go a long way to giving those sets of people a pathway to kind of seeing their grievances maybe being responded to within the quote unquote conventional world politics, whereas they don't typically have that belief. Great. So we have a question from John Funabiki, and he's going to turn his camera and mic on. Um, it's about a, a different topic, but um, John, do you want to offer your question? Yeah, hi. This has been absolutely awesome. I've, I've had a transcendent uh, uh, experience here. Um, but I wanted to come to the core, kind of the core topic here, which is science and evidence-based media. And I speak as a journalist and, ex and with experience in philanthropy. There's a, there's a story in today's Washington Post about um, how conservative media really have shaped public opinion and caused create, uh, confusion about the pandemic, uh, spread concert, uh, conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. And my question is, is what could both the scientific community and the philanthropic community do to combat conservative media, number one? And number two, I mean, really, you know, I, I'm thinking, Think how long it took the New York Times to, to be willing to use the word lie in relationship to President Trump. They had all kinds of verbal contortions to try to get across that idea until finally they said, yeah, we have to call them lies. When should we do the same with conservative media? For anyone. Uh, so I'll jump, this is uh, Kishore. So we, we just finished uh, a round of research looking at uh, public be health behaviors and adherence to public health behaviors in particular cities and what drove that. And generally speaking, like um, what we saw was that there's a really complicated information ecosystem that people are using to inform the behaviors that we wanna see in the world. Uh, and it's not clear at this time how much information like China created the virus or something along those lines leads to what is critical right now, which is adherence to basic public health guidelines. And we don't really know what the long-term effects. We can study it from what's uh, been seen before, and there's a whole field of the science of science communication that's looked at misinformation and how best to uh, debunk or address it. Um, and, you, you know, I could talk ad nauseum about that, but I think the real issue at hand here is 
the rising uh, partisanship around public health behavior poses a fundamental risk for us to get through this pandemic, uh, according to most scientists. So there is a little bit of like, what, what battles are we choosing to fight when we're talking about um, addressing a known, thing, a known piece of information that are false? Um, because at the end of the day, we really need uh, at this point in the crisis uh, to see uh, people believe that basic measures of public health are trustworthy regardless of their partisanship status. So in this way, like we really want to see more consistent messages come from the federal government uh, to come from government agencies at the, at the local levels. Uh, and that would be incredibly powerful to counterdict some of the things that like Kathleen Hall Jamison highlighted in the study in the, in the Washington Post today. Uh, when it comes to debunking, like stuff like when Plandemic came out and was shared on, on Facebook, the aggressive sort of move by the scientific community to address that before it became much larger uh, was very effective and grounded in, in, in what we know to work in terms of science communication. But when you're talking about, uh, in the studies you referenced, uh, Sean Hannity on a nightly basis uh, talking about something, that's, a, that's an existing framework, an existing audience that already exists. Uh, scientists spending time debunking is probably not going to have much of a positive impact based on what we know in terms of changing uh, perceptions. In fact, it might do the opposite, it might even harden behavior and increase partisanship uh, divides around this. Uh, the number one thing that, you know, and frankly, the CDC wrote the best playbook around this years ago that, we, that scientists need to be do is convey risk and uncertainty in this time uh, in order for people to make better informed choices. Uh, so acknowledging that masks aren't a panacea and we can go on and on down the line. And right now we're, we're getting a very strong binary showing up um, as opposed to people really making individual choices, which is what this country is sort of built on, that rugged individualism. And so we do need to acknowledge that that's a baseline behavior and lean into it in terms of our communications from the scientists right now. So, great, great answer. so short answer, I'm not sure we can debunk uh, conservative media with existing audiences. Yeah, it may be that the charts that just show a straight up trajectory of rising, uh, you know, infections and deaths is going to be the signal that that forces people to face the fact rather than any encouragement otherwise. But does anybody else have a, a an additional comment they'd like to offer to that point? Um, yeah, just so beyond the sort of um, Kishore sort of touched on like, you know, if if there were more sort of government intervention or uh, government regulation, like that seems like maybe the best thing in terms of and and debunking might not work, but in terms of sort of um, combating the message coming from conservative media, uh, there's some in, maybe encouraging work um, from, actually I think uh, the, the study I'm thinking of comes from climate, studying climate change beliefs. And the idea is that um, when uh, the researchers framed the problem in the values that uh, the different groups of people cared about, that's when you started to see movement. And so I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I'm probably going to botch the uh, citation, but it's, it's something like, you know, for conservatives framing uh, climate change in, in terms of, um, you know, conserving like the, the purity of nature was more effective in getting conservatives to uh, support climate change initiatives. Uh, whereas for uh, liberals, it was more about you know, talking about uh, equality or um, fairness. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so, you know, there's some, and I'm, and I'm actually just thinking about this now because um, I'm doing some research on uh, understanding why people aren't wearing masks, where obviously there's a, there's a political difference, right? Um, and we found this, I mean, this is very early pilot data. We found that um, there's sort of a, a set of beliefs around specifically around uh, masks impinging people's freedom that significantly predicts people not wearing masks and that mediates the effect of conservatism. That is, co conservative, conservatives are less likely to wear masks and that effect is mediated by their belief that it impinges on their freedom. So, you know, one, one strategy, for example, to get 
conservatives to wear masks might be to try to find messages or stories or storytellers who can uh, frame the idea of wearing a mask in a way that uh, pr promotes freedom. Like, you know, like for example, talking about, um, you know, how, how much your freedom will be impinged if you get sick. <laughs> like that's way worse than wearing a mask. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not, a, I don't write the messages. I trust that other people can do that, but that's one idea is just to frame the, whatever the behavior is in the values of the people that you're trying to communicate to. There's not a lot of freedom in the experience of intubation. That's for sure. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together today. Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to offer in retrospect of this discussion? You're on. Sorry. Thank you. Gratitude for the folks that you've organized, Vince, and we've already seen some examples. I, I really picked up on uh, the a word that we need an explosion of, of narratives that can connect us and uh, the relationships that we can have. We've also heard that, uh, that again, and John, I know you know this uh, very well, but there isn't one single audience, there isn't one single solution, there isn't one single uh, bit of research or one single effort that's going to do this. It's highly complex, it's going to be a long time, and so we're all going to need to do it. But I think the uh, thrust, Vince, that you were starting to uh, build on trying to connect more research and people who are doing research with people who are creating practice, with people who understand the ecosystems where there are news deserts, not enough local news. In other words, there's so many pieces of complexity that you covered during this uh, forum and still need to be done, and we need more people funding media uh, and uh, being part of our, our community here so and the research that supports media and the voice so thank you Vince great yes well thank you all uh, our we feel like we've uh, gone back to school for a moment even though they're all closed it was great to have professors with us and all the academic rigor behind some of the ideas that we we uh, explore here today uh, I think this is really going to inspire us to uh, for our own learning agenda in the coming months. Uh, and we hope to hear from uh, all of you in, 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 in the coming months as well, uh, those of you attending and those of you who may be watching on the recording in the future. So thank you all for your contributions and enjoy your summer. Thanks everyone.